10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Hello and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. Native news, native information, I'm your hostess Jeannie Green. The world is in turmoil. We're at war, but war is nothing new here in Alaska if you're considering things like the salmon industry. It seems like we've had a struggle for quite a while. Recently down in southeast Alaska, a conference was held, a big meeting hosted by the Central Council of Clinket and Haida in Juneau, Alaska. We've got that story on what's happening in Southeast Fisheries right after this. Hello from Kink. Heartbeat Alaska will be right back. Heartbeat Alaska is pleased to announce a brand new official hotel. We're brought to you now by Millennium Alaskan Hotel, the official hotel of Heartbeat Alaska. And Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. We've been covering businesses, families, and individuals since before Alaska was a state. And we'll keep doing it until the glaciers melt on Mount McKinley. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. Welcome back. There are over 24,000 Clinket and Haida people in Southeast Alaska. Many small towns and villages have been directly affected by the hardest hit salmon prices in years. We travel now to Southeast Alaska and visit with some people that are trying to find solutions to this problem. of years, the Klinkit Haida and Simsian lived among these towering islands and deep waters. Their lives became intertwined with the rhythms of seasons and the abundance of the sea. This is a halibut hook right here. We get the halibut to come in there and bite. See, the reason why I say it's more deadly than a, than a circle hook is once he gets in there, that's it. Can't get away. When Western civilization swept over the area that would come to be known as Southeast Alaska, the sea began to be used in new ways. The very survival of the natives depended on their ability to adapt quickly to new ways of thinking, new ways of doing business. Subsistence fishermen quickly became commercial fishermen. The days of 50-foot cedar canoes and carved halibut hooks gave way to nets and wooden sailing boats. Today we have the age of diesel and GPS, refrigerated seawater, 
and fish tracking radar. Through all this, there is one thing that hasn't changed. The lives of the people that live in these ancient coastal villages are still intertwined with the sea. Everybody in the coastal villages has generations of families that have made a living from this. And it is part of our life, it's part of our culture, it's part of who we are. And um, that's why these communities were, were built where they are. Uh, we just can't abandon that. We've all had friends and relatives that have lost their lives to sea, uh, making a living from this. And what I was reminding them yesterday was that these people are still a part of our lives. They're not forgotten in our villages. But once again, forces from the outside are changing everything. One thing that the professor at the University of Washington told me stuck with me. Maybe this isn't the place to bring this up, but he said that humans had domesticated every food source but fish, and that we would someday domesticate fish too. That day is upon us. Fish farming is now commonplace around the world, and while fish farms are illegal in Alaska, they are having a huge impact on Alaska's fishermen. Catching fish in the wild is more expensive and unpredictable than raising them in pens. A flood of these farm-raised salmon on the world market is driving prices lower and lower. To make matters worse for fishermen in Alaska, some large fish farming companies are willing to sell below cost in order to take more market share. To the people here, taking market share means putting them out of business. Uh, people who had been in the business 50, 60 years and were successful fishermen lost their markets. They lost their, their gear, their boats, their limited entry licenses. And that Robert Losher is an assemblyman for Clinket and Haida Central Council. He's been around fishing all his life, but he's never seen what he's seeing now. We have a terrible crisis, a disaster occurring across Alaska, and particularly in southeastern Alaska. It's sad to, <clears throat> to hear that in our boat harbors, uh, harbor masters are telling me that people are literally walking away from their vessels, leaving them to the public, not paying their stall rents, and just walking away from the industry. And in our communities, there's lots of housing vacancies. People are walking away from houses and trailers and and moving their families from our coastal communities. And that's really sad to hear. It really affects our communities greatly. And these people are vital to the future of our industry. And we need to figure out a way to help the families of Alaska who are so reliant upon the salmon industry to come back. That's why they are here, the Clinket and Haida Central Council recently hosted a three-day meeting, Salmon for Success. People in all aspects of the salmon industry travel to Juneau looking for solutions. Just before the meeting began, there was more bad news. Ward's Cove, a fish processing company with plants all over southeast Alaska, announced it will close its doors. The Seattle-based company also plans to sell its plants, leaving little hope they will ever return. Well, Ward's Cove decided they weren't going to operate this year because they didn't get the capital to operate, and they pulled out of uh, some of the big markets, uh, Excursion Inlet, they had a cannery for coal storage in Cray. Uh, they had several in Ketchikan and they had over 100 boats fishing for it, so over 100 purse centers without a market is a huge problem uh, for many communities all over southeast Alaska. We feel like we're asking the right uh, road to become a uh, very successful operation. Dwayne Wilson is a fisherman from Haynes, Alaska. Haynes is on the northern end of Lynn Canal. For a fishing vessel, the equivalent of a dead-end street. The Ward's Cove plant in Haines was the only processor he could sell to. The Ward's Cove closure has definitely caused that uh, mass confusion and uh, 
mass uh, uh, feeling in the state of emergency uh, for trying to market the fish. Ward's Cove is a perfect example of how the salmon industry works in Southeast and a perfect example of what went wrong. You see, months before any fishing boats went out, Ward's Cove went to a bank to get what's called a pack loan. They'd use that money to buy fish from fishermen. Most of the fish was put in cans, and the cases full of cans are called the pack. When the pack is sold, Ward's Cove would make enough money to repay that year's loan and have a nice profit. Over the last hundred years, the cannery became a fixture in many villages. Canning fish was the best way to preserve it for a long trip to market. But now, the trip to market is getting shorter. The market is demanding newer and greater products, more of the fresh or the frozen fillets and other kinds of products that are more usable to the housewife across America and the world. So those cans aren't selling so well anymore. Canned salmon market has a surplus inventory of two and a half years backlog in inventory. And the question is, what do we do in the face of a large run of pink salmon, and where are the markets? This, coupled with cheaper farm-raised salmon, means the old way of doing business doesn't work anymore. This year, when Ward's Cove went to the bank for a pack loan, the bank said no. But the salmon will still return this year, and if the predictions are right, in record numbers. Right now, we're facing a 92 million pink salmon coming to southeast Alaska, which is like 25 to 30 percent greater projected uh, harvestable surplus uh, than we've ever expected in the past years. And what has occurred here with Ward's Cove Packing Company um, quitting the business, basically, is that we have <clears throat> not enough processing capacity to handle all this fish nor do we have markets. Pink salmon make up about half of the harvest in southeast Alaska. Pinks are less valuable, so why not just let them go? The biologists have told us that when there's a huge escape in the pink salmon, just uh, totally drowns out the remaining run. And as a result, what happens is that uh, you run into a situation where you have poor wild runs in the future. So, you know, got to get rid of them somehow. In other words, too many pinks would reduce the number of the other more lucrative salmon that could breed. The purse seiners, when they go out, uh, if you don't have a market for pink salmon, some of them have no really reason why they should be out there fishing uh, once the pink run starts coming in. They don't have a market, they can't fish. And if they don't fish, Many small villages in southeast Alaska will be left with almost no income. If the fisherman doesn't make money, neither does the storekeeper. And if the storekeeper can't pay his property taxes, the village government can't provide basic services. But in a changing market, who wants all those pink salmon? When Heartbeat Alaska returns, we'll see who wants those pink salmon and learn about possible solutions to a complicated problem. You're late, Dad. I know, I know. I'm almost done with my homework. Yeah? That's just mad at you. What's mad at me about? You said you would play basketball with her. She said she'll never speak to you again. <laughs> Parents that are involved with their kids are more likely to help keep their kids away from drugs. Okay, <laughs> nothing but that. <laughs> Each week, 
Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Northland. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. Turn it up! at the height of the Simshian. These native people have some of the most fabulous tasting native food around straight from the sea. I was born in Sitka and I remember plates of herring and plates of dried seaweed, plates of dried fish, smoked fish, fabulous, fabulous food. Now with the fishing industry in trouble, the natives of Southeast Alaska are looking at different solutions to market these foods. If you can imagine, it was totally amazing to me that in Russia when a housewife goes to the store she has pork or chicken or pink salmon and that is a part of their society and their culture the resources of pink salmon in, in Russia have been depleted and over harvested and now they're looking for another supply and this could benefit Alaskans greatly to deal with the surplus pink salmon that it has this forthcoming year. And the Russians are willing to come here to get them. Right now there's an application before Governor Murkowski which merely requires an executive decision on his part to authorize a foreign fish processor to come into Alaska to take that pink salmon. And that's Global Seafoods. North America has that application. And they will take that pink salmon and sell it into the Russian market. It's pink salmon in the round or gutted fish. It will become a part of the staple of marketing to housewives in Russia. But it may not be that easy. Governor Murkowski is bound by a federal law called the Magnuson-Stevens Act. It prevents foreign processors from operating unless domestic ones don't have the capacity or intent to process those fish. Currently, the governor's office is surveying the remaining fish processors to answer that question. And there are other concerns. Domestic processors don't think it's fair that the foreign vessels are not subject to America's tougher labor laws and higher minimum wage, and their concerns don't end there. Well, there are a bunch of perceived problems by the onshore processors are concerned that this product will compete and come back into America from Russia. That's further from the case. Uh, the global seafoods will take that fish and will go f fresh and frozen right into the Russian market, not come back to American cans. Global seafoods doesn't do canning business, so we shouldn't expect that. The other problem <clears throat> is the business of payment to fishermen. Uh, there have been foreign processors who have come to <clears throat> offshore uh, waters of Alaska and not paid the fishermen, but global seafoods intends to have a line of credit with Wells Fargo Bank and pay fishermen based off on fish tickets and they can go to their bank and cash their fish tickets for for payment. Even though the Russians may pay less than Ward's Cove did, many people here think less money is better than none. Well it's a short-term solution until, um, until processors can um, sit back and do some strategic planning and figure out what kind of market they want to get involved in how many fishermen they want to employ and, um, and get rid of their inventory. They have a huge inventory of canned pink salmon. And uh, by bringing in foreign processes, I think that uh, they might be able to get rid of that and um, by then they would have their strategic planning done and they can move forward. Uh, I think it's worth a, worth a try. I think uh, policy will need to be written up 
uh, from the state of Alaska or the U.S. Uh, Congress to uh, state that this is just a temporary thing, it's not permanent. Uh, this is until we get back on our feet in the world market. My brother Ted, he was in the fish business for 20 years and he'll tell you right to your face, it's a marketing problem. We got a marketing problem. And that's where the money should be going. We need to get back our markets. Don Bremer comes from a long line of fishermen. He knows the only way Alaska can compete with cheaper farm salmon is get the message out. Wild, Alaska salmon is better. The fact of the matter is, most consumers rank quality as the number one factor when choosing salmon. We've, uh, we've targeted the uh, high value, uh, good flesh quality seafood and uh, you know we've uh, taken some steps to alleviate the problems that we've had with the poor flesh quality in uh, composting some of that stuff, uh, value adding the seafood that uh, does come into the plant either through smoking or through uh, uh, adding some value through fletches or fillets. So we've tried to increase our value every step of the, the process. Sam Jackson is president and CEO of Cake Tribal Corporation. Like many villages in Southeast, Cake struggled with low salmon prices. Then, by looking back at their traditions, Cake saw the way to the future. We've come from the sea. Uh, we feel that we can make money from the sea, and we feel that the, the sea is our future. And that's, uh, that's what has transpired at Cake Foods Incorporated, is that we're trying to uh, maximize the value of the seafood industry that, uh, that's sitting right outside our door. Right outside Cake's door are some of the best fishing grounds in the world. The direct benefit of, uh, of, the, the, of the location of Cake Foods Incorporated is it's right in central southeast Alaska. It's uh, two hours from Chatham Strait. It's right outside Frederick Sound. It's right in Kiki Strait where all the fisheries occur. And, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't sell to Cake Foods, they'll be running five hours to Petersburg or ten hours to Juneau to deliver their product and we feel that if we capture that uh, species of salmon or, or species of crab or species of halibut or black cod that we can ma maximize the quality of that product by minimizing the uh, the run time between uh, the next processor down the road so we feel we have a competitive advantage by our location. In 1998 Cake Tribal Corporation opened the doors of a new processing facility they named Cake Foods. They looked hard at the changing salmon markets and began making products to fit. Ken Newman is the general manager at Cake Foods. In 2001, we did 8,000 pounds of Dungeon Crab. In 2002, we did 400,000 pounds. And what we were trying to do is think out of the box there. Representatives from Cake Foods made quite a splash at the Salmon for Success meeting. In an industry that's losing money all over, Cake's operation is growing by leaps and bounds. When Cake Foods was formed, they hired experts in the industry. Duff Mitchell is their chief operations officer. We don't believe that failure is an option. Uh, a lot of our people are employed in our facility and uh, They've been processing or fishing for generations, and we feel it's, we, we, have to, we have to do what we have to do. Many at the meeting saw Cake's food strategy of high-quality products that fit into niche markets as the future of the industry. Um, it's a model worth looking at because the community has a commitment. That includes the corporation and uh, the fishermen. And they do, on an annual basis, uh, strategic planning and get all the stakeholders involved in the whole thing, the fishermen, the community, the processing unit, and figure out what we did wrong last year and what we did right, and make a commitment to what we did right and try other things. And that's the procedure that everybody has to go through in this um, fisheries economy. You know, the value added products out of cake is, is a pretty adventurous um, um, path that they have been taking for a lot of years. Uh, I remember when they first bought the Pelican Seafoods, uh, uh, Governor Knowles, a big press release, a big to-do about uh, congratulating Cake uh, Tribal Corporation for having 
uh, the courage to do that. And um, they are on the right path. Uh, of course, then again, it's just like uh, any other product. They need visibility. They need market acceptance. And I think if they survive, they will do really well with their product. And uh, we all need to be heading that way in, in some of the rural villages. I've watched it develop over the years, and it's getting better and better. We're getting better equipment, and making more money. Proud to say that I work here and put out good products and getting recognition all over the place for it. In the next Heartbeat Alaska, we'll visit Cake and take a tour of the plant. We'll also find out how this strange looking machine is helping to solve one of the toughest issues in the new salmon economy. Alaska, there are people working hard to make this a better place. There are people working to bring families and villages together, working to save lives, working to get you home. Grant Aviation, they'll get you home. We've been covering businesses, families, and individuals since before Alaska was a state. And we'll keep doing it until the glaciers melt on Mount McKinley. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. Kenai Peninsula College, part of UAA, and Alaska Christian College, working together for the future. For the first time, I really looked at my life like I held a mirror up to it, and I got to see who I really was. An opportunity to challenge yourself. Made me feel like I was at home. Small classes designed for your success. It's challenging, but it's not overwhelming. A quality education in a rural environment. We are definitely a family, <laughs> and everything that comes with it. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. The people at Cake Foods are gearing up for summer. They are an enterprising, very, very enterprising group of people. And they are going to prosper, I promise you. Thank you so much, Cake Foods in Cake Alaska, for your help in this story. And thank you, Central Council of Clinkett and Haida. Thank you so much, Gordon Jackson. God bless every single one of you. Thank you all for watching. Join me again next week for more Heartbeat Alaska. To purchase a copy of this program, ask for Heartbeat number 4403. That's 4403. And send your check or money order for $20 to Jeannie Green Productions, 6216 Old Seward Highway, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. Or give us a call, 907-563-7440.